Hey everybody, this is Perch. A handful of news items we can just go through, um, and one of them is kind of a confirmation on something that seemed to be the case. Uh, Superman Son of Kal-El number 5, or the coming out issue, which has received considerable media attention and has received considerable reorders and and push. And, and of course it was going to. There's this weird argument going on right now where people are looking at the uh, comic run numbers for uh, Superman, and they're pointing out that the series has had a significant drop, which it has. First issue came out, and like all first issues now, there's the law of diminishing returns. So if you compare it to Bendis's Superman, it's uh, it's much lower. The first issue got a big spike of sales. It had a varying cover. It had a lot of, of hype around it. The Superman Son of Kal-El comic, which is in effect Superboy. I, I understand he's, he's calling himself Superman and everything else, but if you're talking about how comic shop retailers are going to order this and how they're going to think about it, then they're going to think about this as Superboy. I, I, I Again, I know it's called Superman. I had this argument with somebody like, no, it's called Superman. Yeah, but it's the Son of Superman. So you can call it whatever you want. But when the retailers are ordering this, they're going to think of it as Superboy, and they're going to lower. And they did order lower. Issue number one sold a, a, you know, a number of units, healthy for a number one. Uh, or at least I, when I say healthy, I say in line with the current industry, which is healthy. Um, no, now, I'm, now I'm mincing my words a lot. Look, if you sell a comic over 50,000 copies right now, it's going to pencil out profitable and successful for a comic company. Now, you can certainly compare that to like the 80s when you had uh, hundreds of thousands of books going out because of the newsstand, or even like 2005 where you had uh, comics regularly pushing over 100,000. It's not doing those kinds of numbers, but the price has also gone up. And so it, it, this is a kind of a, this becomes a, a rat's mess of a rat's nest of an argument. The, the point here is, number one, sold okay, didn't sell as well as Bendis' number one, didn't sell as well as other heavily hyped number ones, like what you might see if, uh, say, Donny Cates uh, relaunches a comic over at Marvel with a new number one, you're going to see you're gonna see numbers push north of 100,000. It didn't do that. Number two saw a steep drop. It seemed to be heading for the 40s. And if you can kind of track out what Superman has done historically, it's likely it was headed into the low 40s. Um, I, unlikely it would go into the 30s. Again, you can look at Bendis' run, and there's a video on that on my channel you can go look at for, for the Superman numbers, and you can kind of see exactly what it would do. But it was going to settle into the lower 40s, most likely. Now, this got a bunch of news media attention, so now it's going to sell a bunch. So there's a run on the issues. They're going to reprint a bunch of this stuff. They're going to run back to press. This has created demand. The, the question mark really isn't, will it create demand? Because of course it was going to. It got big media attention. You've got the New York Times and you got CNN covering it and everything else. Of course it's going to get attention. The question mark becomes, what happens with Superman, Son of Kal-El, number 10? So what happens five issues from now? Are the numbers still up? Are a bunch of people going to run in to buy, quote unquote, the coming out issue and then walk away? How many people are going to come and buy it not realizing it's the Son of Superman? Um, I, who knows? I, I would guess quite a few. But Superman Son of, uh, Son of Kal-El number five is the coming out issue, and it was originally colored by Gabe Elteb, uh, who did a bunch of interviews kind of saying that how much he disliked the change of the slogan. Uh, he's got a video up there where he explains himself, but shortly after, his comments got a bunch of media attention, which... Uh, I can confirm several people in D.C. are extremely pissed about because basically they wanted to time the news cycle of John Kent's coming out, this slogan uh, is being changed, they wanted to own the news cycle. And what happened is the colorist kind of came in here and uh, grabbed a bunch of headlines. Now, a lot of these industries, like you see, um, Newsweek did an article saying Superman artist quits DC characters, say they're ruining characters. It's written from the perspective of this guy is a is a lunatic. It's, it's, it's definitely, and a lot of these are written of, look at these crazy conservatives trying to cancel something. And I think that is kind of what's going on with a lot of these, uh, these outlets. They, they want to tell the story that um, conservatives who have rallied against cancel culture now suddenly want to cancel something. That's, that's kind of the, the angle that they're going for here. But after this happened, the, uh, the comic got delayed for a week, and there was some speculation it was being recolored. Well, yes, it is being recolored. So Hi-Fi Studio has been brought in. This is the, uh, the duo husband and wife coloring team, Brian Miller, Christy Miller. Um, they've, of course, done tons and tons of stuff across all the different companies. They are going to, they have basically recolored the, the comic. And you can see their colors are just a little bit different, a little bit more muted, I would say, kind of in how it's done. But anyway, they've recolored the comic. Why would DC do this? Um, you know, 
probably out of irritation, certainly, that uh, Gabe went public with all this. I definitely think there was a, that was a huge factor. I think that uh, they also want to kick him out of any royalties coming out of those comics. They knew they were going to sell quite a bit, and they are. I, I would suspect that's a reason. I may be wrong, but I would suspect there's a little bit of vindictiveness there. And uh, I think it's a statement. They didn't want his name on the cover of this comic that was going to get a bunch of attention. And then people go and they look at the, you know, look up this person and find all these articles uh, basically insulting DC. So he is out. Hi-Fi Studio is in, and they will be. Yeah, they're, they're working on this comic. Then um, a couple people have alerted me or, you know, have <laughs> have been sending me this story uh, asking me to comment on it about the uh, transsexual uh, character in Wonder Woman, specifically in Nubia. And the, uh, the, the idea of, of basically that there's a trans woman on Wonder Woman's Paradise Island on Themyscira. So um, basically, what is this? So this is from uh, Nubia and the Amazons number one. And when I say it's from, I'm, I'm actually not really. And I'll explain that in a minute. So this is written by Vida Ayala, Stephanie Williams, uh, Aletha Martinez. And it uh, you basically get a scene where there's a bunch of um, uh, Amazons kind of sitting around a table eating. I, I don't know. They're, they're having dinner. And they're introducing. They're talking to each other. And there's um, new Amazons. But basically, the... The whole point, the solicitation of this is Nubia is the queen of the Muscaria. Uh, Hippolyta is off running around with the Justice League. And uh, there's an unexpected arrival of new Amazons. Our hero is forced to reckon with her past and forge ahead. So it's, it's, a, it's a Nubia story. But uh, they're introducing kind of this bigger mythology. So um, th there's nothing in the comic that goes, hey, here's a trans character. Uh, there, there's, there's nothing at all. If you're looking at the, the drawings, I think you'd really have to be wanting to read into something. I would say there's, there's no, there's not like an obvious trans de depiction in the comic. Um, the writer, Stephanie Williams uh, writes, uh, on, on Twitter saying, uh, she says, if you've read Nubia and the Amazons number one, the answer to your burning question is yes, there are trans Amazons. One of the newest Amazons is a black trans woman. As, import, as much as it's important for Nubia in the Amazon's miniseries to reintroduce Nubia and establish her definitive role in DCU, it is also important to make clear that the Muscari is a place for all women. As much as it is important for Nubia in the Amazon miniseries to reintroduce Nubia, establish her definitive role in DCU, it is also important to make clear that the Muscari is a place for all women. Bia, Bia, B, BIA uh, will have a role on Themyscaria beyond just existing. She isn't set dressing. She isn't a box to tick. She is a fully fledged character. It's important to the community, just as black trans women are important to us in real life. As for her name, Stephanie Williams added, Bia name was inspired by Titan, goddess of the same name who represents power and energy. Now, again, this this panel where you see you're, you're introduced to Sister Bia, um, it, 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 there's nothing... There's nothing in it like they don't they don't have like a caption it doesn't identify the character as trans and you wouldn't know it from the comic and that's the question i got did they really introduce this yes i mean per the writer but there's not a scene in this comic where they go into the character is trans um so which okay so that that's your answer um i do think there's a question you know how how is this uh does this fit with what we've known about them as scary in the past uh, Vita and Stephanie are both saying that there, um, you know, there's going to be more to it. Um, we are glad people picked up on it, if, but if y'all hadn't, we would have made sure to say it so it wasn't hand waveable subtext. Um, it seems like a bit of a cheat, to be blunt. I mean, you, it wasn't really mentioned in the comic. It was a very, very subtle thing, and it's like let's hope the readers pick up on it. And if they don't pick up on it, then we'll we'll tell them it's there. I mean, okay, you, you can do whatever you want uh, for the comic. I do think there's some questions to answer. Hopefully they will do that. How does this match with, uh, you know, what we've seen from uh, the, the Amazons and Themis Carriage Pass? It doesn't seem to match the past, but, you know, I, the bonus is on the writer. Or stick it. You know, a lot of people are, are posting videos and talking about how this is, in, you know, a, a, just a lot of negative feedback on it. I think the best, uh, if, if you're the writer, all right, explain it then. I mean, just explain it. I, how does this fit? We, we, it doesn't seem to fit, but, but, you know, I'm sure you have a reason. So let's, let's hear it. That's, that's the step I'm waiting for at this point. But to the people ask questions, no, there wasn't really anything in the comic. It was just this, I mean, you're seeing it on the screen. That's, that's what, that's it. That's what you're seeing. So, um, I mean, okay. 
I, I again, I, I don't know, you know, if, if uh, <laughs> put it this way, um, Vita's correct. I, I, if, if people didn't pick up on it, or I guess some people picked up on the subtext of it, but I mean, all right. Um, cool. I, I, I'm wondering who the, uh, how would you pick up on this subtext? Ah, it's fine. Anyway, there you go. So that's what's happening. Color has changed. Uh, and there, yes, there's a trans character in uh, Nubia and apparently is part of, of the Muscaria and somebody's going to explain that at some point. So there you have it. News for the day. Yay. And Alec Baldwin's having an awful day. Thanks for listening. <laughs>